Yeah, the second, second part of this pre or second presentation is like, uh, how to put it, like uh, a little summarized version. I have this uh, much greater and uh, expanded version, but I won't go through it because it will take too much time. So I'm just asking how much time do we have this time? Is it like 30 minutes or when do we, when do we want to end? Yeah, let's try 30. So you like, you just take your time. Okay, okay. So no, no, no rush. So no rush, but uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, so yeah, we, we did this, so we checked all right. <laughs> so topics, uh, optimizing. So now you have some kind of build. Uh, how can you make it like, like neater and smaller and faster and all that, and how to speed up Webpack? Uh, some ideas related to output, like uh, Webpack decides its name, it does something else too, and uh, I have some SSR topic and just a couple of random thoughts. Something about consuming packages, because if you think about web development, it's that uh, I want to do a thing, then I go to NPM, and then I do NPM install, blah, and now it's done. So, like, consuming packages is, is kind of important, so it's good to discuss the topic. I'll also show you how to extend Webpack. I mean, you could spend two hours just discussing extending Webpack, but I'll do it in five minutes so you get basic ideas. <laughs> so, optimizing. Uh, in Webpack 2, we added new feature, uh, performance budgets. Because the developers are developers, then you have 10 megabyte bundle and nobody's happy. So, for that reason, you can set these limits for your developers. And you can even make it failure built. So, if you have hint error, it's going to crash, and that's good. So now, now you can tell that, yeah, 100k is fine. And you have to stick with that. Uh, this is like example of the warning. In, in the book practice, it's too big because 156 is bigger than 100. So now I have to do something. And the first obvious thing is minification or minifying. So the point is that of minification is that we take the original source and we crunch it and still retain the original meaning. You can also do transformations that lose something SSL. I don't know if you have Angular 1 user still, but uh, it has this specific case, like uh, it has this model pattern, and it relies on function parameter names, and if you do something nasty, like rewrite the parameter names, it's, it's going to break things in Angular 1. So that's a good example of how to break code with minification. You have three main options, Anglified.js plugin, Bubbly Webpack plugin, Webpack uh, closer compiler. The problem with Uglify is that it doesn't support ES6 yet. So now you have Babel present enough in your project, and it, it you get some ES6 feature to it, and you pass it to Uglify.js, and it's going to crash so, and burn, so it's not going to work. So for that reason, you have to use Bubbly Webpack plugin. So it's this little thing. It supports ES6. When I saw this first time, I was really scared. I never used 0, 0.0 something, but it actually works, so you can you can use it. <laughs> it the reasoning I asked why it follows Babelly versioning, so I don't know. That's why it's 0, 0.0 or something. Uh, you can do the same for CSS. So CSS loader actually provides mini minification option, if I remember right. And uh, you can also use a plugin, and through the plugin you can use this clean CSS, CSS, no, no. You can do the same for HTML. And there's post HTML that achieves this. Uh, and the tree taking, I mean, this is my movie reference, right? I don't know a single person that knows the reference, but I know it. So I guess that's, that's what's important. So I have second bake, it's from the movie, and then I have this import bake. And the point is that because we are not using shake, we can drop it from the build. So we get just bake on this model and uh, this retains its current code. So this uh, feature allows us to drop code based on static analysis. And the important thing to understand is that it relies on ES6 model definition. So it has to be ES6 exports and imports and so on. It won't work at common JS. So it has to be exactly like that. So ES6 model definition, and if you write packages, you have to be a little careful. So you have to retain these model definitions. Otherwise, uh, your consumers won't be able to uh, uh, shake the tree. So uh, also look in the Babel plugin transform import. This can, my understanding is that this can be useful here. Because this can rewrite import and then you get like something smarter. 
but there's also this technique of, uh, I mean, sometimes you have the problem uh, that uh, you, you want certain code to exist only in certain environments. So for instance, you have like development utilities and it doesn't make sense to expose those to uh, the production build. So maybe you want to do this kind of pattern. So you have if something is equals development, so you can do this environment checks. Or you can you maybe you want to do like uh, feature toggles. So you have like custom features that aren't ready, but they are in source. You can put them behind these flags. And the point is that we can perform replacement against these free variables. So we can replace this free variable with something else. So if it's development, then th then it's just going to be true, and it's going to the source. If it's false, then it's going to be eliminated. And you can do this like there are at least two main ways. In Webpack, you have define plugin, and if you use Babel, then you can use at least three different plugins. I don't know why there are three plugins, but there are. But yeah, you get this feature flag pattern and model choosing pattern and so on. Uh, about hashes, this is the second part of the bundle splitting problem. Because it's not enough to split bundles, you still have to attach those hashes to the names. So that then you get this cache posting. So then the client knows to download it. So this is an example of, of what it might look like. So you can app that has to chase. And to do this, you, you can use common you can use placeholders. So you get name, true name of course, and next to extension. Chunk has is, uh, is calculated based on entry. So you have this entry, and there are the models, and chunk has is calculated based on all that. But it's important to note, important to note that if you extract, then you have to use content has, because it's, based, it's the calculated based on content. So it, because that's the right, right choice with extra text plugin. Uh, there's one more thing, it's manifest. Now I have to do some live coding and hope everything goes fine. So let's see. So I'll just open this configuration file and uh, now I have to hack it. So I'll do a little simplification so you can see what's going on. Oh, do, 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 what if? Oh. Yes, that. Uh, this is actually a little abstraction of a common stack plugin, but you will see in a bit what I mean. Do, do, do. I'll just do a build. Oops, I broke something so ah yeah yeah yeah. Let's do this. Yeah, let's reset and uh, do it again. Uh, it's not my day, sorry. Yes, yeah, the problem with live coding that it sounds fine and great and but it never goes right. So now we have built so the, it's a basic setup. We have that app bundle and vendor bundle, and uh, I'll just show you. So we have so we have some files. Uh, the the problematic part is here. So here we have the vendor bootstrap script, and the actual problem exists. Uh, blah blah. blah it's here. So here's the manifest. So manifest tells Webpack where to start start from. I mean, it's like model IDs and all that. The problem is that because it's in this vendor file, it's possible to make a change in the app file that's going to change this definition. And when that happens, it's going to invalidate the app file and it's going to invalidate the vendor file because the definition, definition changed. So a change made in app can uh, cause invalidation in vendor and that's definitely something we don't want. It's, it's from behavior. So for that reason, we have to do a little trick. We have to extract a manifest or, or that bootstrap script into something else. And that this actually goes through common stack plugin. And it, it's not related to that name. So I can do something like uh, reversed. Because I mean, I went to Germany and I had this or organic uh, hipster reversed, which was great. It cost like 10 euros, but it was great. <laughs> so I can do like this. So, oof. Yeah, so I have, so, so, so you see, there's the bootstrap script and here's the problematic portion. So now the problem has been solved. So there's no problem anymore because if I make a change, it's not going to invalidate both vendor app. And now, now it's, it has been encapsulated into a single file. 
Another option would be to use a plugin to write it into index, index HTML, but uh, I like to use this file, file solution in the book. But yeah, go through comments and plugin. It's, it's in the book, so I, I want to dig into that. But uh, you, you saw the basic idea, the basic problem, so you know how to solve it. Any plan to incorporate it into the Webpack core? I don't know any plan, so maybe we have to kind of force Tobias to do it. Because you it know. seems to be, like my post gets like, I don't know, 1500 reads in a week. Yes, yes, it's a common it problem. It's just a, yeah, yes, 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 it's, it's, yeah, it's a common problem. So, so we have to join our forces and right. make Tobias do it. <laughs> yeah. To just like do this out of the box. Yes, yes, like, yes, yes. Forget about this. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I mean, this is a slide that should not exist. Yeah. So we have to do some lobbying. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> Yeah, there's also this problem of records because if you are using code splitting, so if you are using code splitting, then you get this hashing, hashing problem, and uh, because of that, because, uh, you, ha you have to use records because records allow you to track old module IDs. I mean, this sounds complex, but it's actually single field. But uh, the file looks like this; it contains the information related to module IDs. And to use this, you have single field records, but it's going to write the file, and Webpack is going to pick up the file based on that. But this brings new problem. Now you have new file to manage during your build. I don't have a good solution for managing this file yet. So maybe it means you will need like third-party service where you push the file and you fetch the file or something like that. But uh, it's like advanced thing. Just good to know because if you have code splitting and want caching for, for those, you will bump into records. But uh, anything I just explained, it doesn't matter if you don't understand. So that's why it's good to analyze. So you get the flags like JSON and profile. I'll show you how to do that, how to use this. So it's like uh, uh, stats. So I just wrote a line like this. So you have webpack and I want to use production and I want the timing information. I want the model information and I, I, I pipe it to stat to JSON. And what the, what that looks like is like this. So you have tons of information about models and so on. But the problem is that because we are not computers, we cannot tell what's going on. Okay. But uh, it has this for us. So we don't have to kind of be computers. We can use existing tools. So you have like, uh, you know, Graph, graphs are fun. Uh, then you have pies, like pie number one, pie number two. Uh, stars, star maps, yeah, this cool. And tree map, uh, this, and so. And uh, this is actually cool, match. You give your source to match, and it gives you the, the shape of the source. So we have tools like this, and these are valuable. So if you look at like Webpack Visualizer, yeah, I don't have. I don't want to push the session there, so I just use demo. So you can see that yeah, we are using React Router and Markdown. It there's something big. It's React. If you kick React out of the project, it's going to be really small. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but we can use Preact. I mean, if you have Preact, then it's like 10k and yeah. But I mean, this talk is not about Preact. So. But performance, so how, how to tune it? It's good to understand that Webpack is it's going to run in single instance. So you have 16 core machine, and now 15 cores are like like idling, they're doing nothing, and one core is doing the work. So parallelization, maybe you can look into that. Maybe you can use faster source map variants, or maybe you can skip uh, like source map, because who is source map anyway? Uh, maybe you can skip polyfills during development. Maybe you don't need them. So maybe you can do, do this like if you do against like latest Chrome. Maybe you don't need all that uh, that you have in web present enough. Maybe you can simplify. Maybe you don't need to develop the whole application at once. Maybe you can skip only just pick one slice and develop that less to bundle. Or because Tobias is a Windows developer, he likes DLLs. <laughs> So he wrote this plugin that can, that can write DLL out of your vendor bundle. And then you can point to the vendor bundle, uh, and you don't have to compile it all time. So we get this nice Windows feature in Webpack. <laughs> Just to recap, uh, to get started, set performance budget. So it gives you limits. Uh, then minify, uh, and do it for CSS and HTML. And you can use tree-saking, 
as well. I mean, it, I think it's a really hyped feature, but you know, it's three seconds. And you can do this anywhere variable tricks. So you can you can basically you can choose what code uh, goes to which uh, target. And when it comes to caching, just use those hashes in file names. And you get that manifest problem we talked about. And records, if you use code splitting. And analysis is like the key to everything. So if you know what's going on in your build, then you can actually optimize it. And you have to know a little bit about Webpack before you can actually optimize it, optimize behavior, uh, and so on. But if you have any questions about optimization, please. So it's the same as in previous presentations. So first, no questions, and then a lot of questions. Yeah. Can you operate with the DLL plugin? It's uh, it's a pair of I mean two plugins. One plugin to write, one plugin to read the DLL. Uh, the problem is that now you have something extra to maintain. So you have to take your this this vendor thing, and write this it it to a DLL. It also means that whenever your vendor dependencies change somehow, you have to generate the DLL again. So it comes with this overhead, and it's like extra file to maintain and push to repository as well. So should it be pushed to the repository because it's a generated file, right? Yeah, but if you don't push, then then developers have to generate it at least once. I mean, I guess there are two solutions: you either push it or you don't, and force developers to at least generate it once. So I guess both will work. I don't know actually if this is better because uh, if you start pushing like big files to repository, then it's just going to grow the repository. So, or maybe this means that you have to write a service. So you have this service, and then you push to the service that there's the other service somewhere, and then you start like thinking like in terms of. I mean, there there was some company that is exactly like this. So they do the others through service with Webpack. So something really neat. <laughs> Yeah, I know the company, but I. Oh, so I'll, uh, yeah, but I'll show it later. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's a difficult topic. Yep. Maybe this will go forward because there's like 30 minutes. So I'll put. As, this is just a couple of ideas I found interesting. It's not like everything. I just want to spend a couple of minutes on progressive web app, web apps. So the point is. That in proxy web apps, it's this demonstration. We get it's something Google introduced a couple of months ago, and the point is that uh, if you look at the web, it's super slow on mobile because people have these huge applications; they load really slow. So Google doesn't like it, so they gave us PVA or or the idea of PVA, and the the point is that we start splitting our application and. It actually is. This is where Webpack code splitting kicks in. So we can do this little split point, little splits, code splits. So we have like admin page. Uh, we get admin shell, admin content, and as we navigate, navigate the application, uh, we get more and more these little uh, little bundles. So we implement the router, and then we just get bit up, it, get it bit by bit. It's a different mindset, but. Uh, if you want to kind of keep your application like performant on mobile, maybe this is something to look into. But it's a pretty new idea, so you won't find a lot of information on it yet. Yeah. Yep. That's a good question. Is it like separate bundle or is it on each? Yeah. I, I would say because in the in the image, I, I don't see like vendor bundle anywhere, so maybe it goes to this content pages. But uh, it's a good question because in 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 practice we could have like something that's common to each. So because there's this other, actually there's other image, and in the other image we have app cell. So maybe the app cell contains something that's common to each. But this is like uh, it's like new world. I don't know it really well yet, but I I think that we can say that co splitting is actually useful. Yeah, it's really hot in here. I mean, it's like, <sighs> yeah, I'm used to like the cool places. <laughs> I was in cellar once. It was great. <laughs> About SSR. So you know the basic idea. You throw the client initial HTML, initial data. Uh, you get maybe potential benefit. 
and you get this search engine optimization benefit again potential. But you get this new problems like how to deal with routing, how to deal with styling, and so on and so on. Lots of problems. Look into Next uh, because I, I think Next it solves a lot of these. So instead of writing your own Next, you can pick this up because they this on this on top of Webpack and they have these solutions. So I would look into this before doing like something on my own. But yeah, Webpack it can do the front end or it can do the both front end and back end in, in as a server. Strict app, you can do multi page setup with Webpack and the PVA is like something I would look into because it looks so interesting. And SSR, yeah, you can do, do it like next and you can do it in front end also in server or so if you have questions related to like these random topics, please. Yeah, I guess we go forward. So packages. You know somewhere you have major minor patch. I mean you do a bug fix, the patch goes up. If you do feature, minor goes up. If you do refactoring, minor goes up. If you break something, major goes up. Uh, it's a little complicated to remember. So there's Comver. If you make something that breaks things, then this goes up and otherwise this goes up. But this, this is like basic information. So I guess like the actually the variant you see most in most in practice is actually this one. So you get these emotional releases. <laughs> People just push yes. yes. They push things and break things. This is actually an important point because you have to be a little careful. You have these version ranges, you do NVM update, now you broke things. So especially yarn lock file is valuable because it's it's a deterministic way for you to lock down your dependencies. I found out today that npm trick wrap is not deterministic, so it's not going to be exactly the same every time you run it. So for my understanding is that log file is the right thing to use at the moment. So you have log file, and uh, now you install the app, do, do npm install, or I mean yarn install or whatever later, and then it's going to be the same, it's going to work. It's easier to maintain. And you can find, you can find specific tooling to help with this problem. So you can run, actually I learned two days ago that Yarn itself contains a little command uh, that gives you like this list of packages that you can update. But you can also find separate tools uh, like updater and so on. Updater, it's like lead name, so updater, okay. And they say that update outdated NPM models with zero pain, so it must be good. good. <laughs> Yeah, but you get these little things, so you don't have to patch them by hand. What's the yarn command? Yeah, I, I have it somewhere. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's, 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 that's yeah, it's somewhere. But uh, yeah, there's a, uh, yeah, that interact. Yeah. But but when it comes to webpack, you have a couple of techniques. Like uh, you can patch. Faulty dependencies through resolve. So that was like one of the first things I mentioned in the presentation. And you can also use externals. So maybe you don't want to handle absolutely everything through Webpack. So use externals array. Uh, when it comes to globals, you have some options, some loaders, a plugin. Especially this is important if you use jQuery or something older. Also, you have plugins to hack around with packaged content. Like Moment.js, so Moment.js it has like 100 languages. Maybe you don't have your application in 100 languages. Maybe you need only three. So you can use context replacement plugin to choose only those languages that make sense for your application. Strict app, same where um, important to understand, but I think locking is the bigger idea. You can find tooling to help with, it, help with these problems. And uh, of course, I mean, you, you cannot go blindly, so you have to have really good tests. And there's the resolve thing, so you can, if there's something nasty in package, you can hack around a little bit. And uh, you can have something to help with globals. And uh, if you have questions, this is the right place. Uh, yeah, I guess everyone wants to restaurant, so we go forward. About extending, uh, two main ways. So we have those loaders and plugins. So there's the slaughter runner. The package it's itself uses slow runner. It's just a little package that provides this run context. I have an example of it in a bit. 
problem is that Loader Runner and Webpack, they have small differences. Something that works in Loader Runner, is, it might not work in Webpack. So you can get, you can get started with the Loader Runner, but, but it is not guaranteed to work in Webpack environments. So if you do something bigger, that's against Webpack itself. Loaders, they are transformations, so they take input and give some output. So we pass foo here and make it foo foo. Not much to it. Uh, the execution flow is actually same as in the, in the in DOM, DOM event model. So we have capture states and bubble states. So we first we go from left to right. We, in Webpack we call it pitching. So there's some model, there's pitch, export pitch. So we go from left to right while pitching. And while executing, we go from right to left. And the point is that during pitching phase, we can uh, terminate execution, or we can actually add that like metadata uh, to, to loaders and so on. But it's it's not as commonly used as uh, the, like the normal normal function. You can write both synchronous and asynchronous loaders. My understanding is that in the future you can write only asynchronous, but it has, it has not been changed yet. Here's the running context, so it's a loader runner. And then we have the loader definition and we pass some file and then we get some result, not much to it. There's some output, so yeah, result, I mean, not much to it. There's something else, I don't really care about the rest, it's the result that matters. API is based on this, and I don't really like this, so maybe I should try to write the API one day, because I, I, wa I want to get rid of this because the problem is that if you use ES6 function definition, it's not going to work. And it looks a little hairy, hairy to, my, to have like this and that. And so, But you can find helpers, loader utils, shamal utils, and there's webpack defaults. And because you're a nice crowd, I will show you a little more. I normally skip this, but I'll, I'll do it just for you. Because it's, there's a great idea behind this package. Okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Now, now it's the hard part. I have to figure out work name. Yeah, I'm using npm. I am too lazy to use yarn. So let's do npm i webpack default. Can you maybe drag the window a bit up? Because you can't. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, good point, good point. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's yeah, I have to, no, no, I'm fighting, sorry, sorry, so sorry. Yeah, now it's better. Let's do this. Yeah, install is still, yeah, but uh, the point, I know. So what it actually that did, it wrote, uh, it has dependency, okay? And it wrote a script. So now we have Webpack default. And what was next is uh, I'm going to do this npm uh, run webpack default. Now it's doing some magic. Uh, we have to wait for magic to complete. Yes, it's always a good idea to run random commands on your computer. Yep. <laughs> yeah, let's do it off. So, yeah, now you see. So we have actually a whole project. So we could start developing a loader or plugin. And maybe this is the way we'll develop loaders and plugins in the future. But the point is that now we have a package, and now I invent something new for Webpack defaults, or someone else invents something new. And we push the features to Webpack defaults, you run npm update, you get the features to your product. Actually, the reason why we wrote this package was to help with, uh, with collaboration and maintenance. So a while ago, we set up an organization, Webpack Contrib. So this is pretty much every, each and every official loader and plugin we have. So what, something like 50. And as you can imagine, it's uh, difficult to maintain because each project is like Snowflake. So it's going to be a little different if you haven't seen Snowflakes. So these are like different projects, but the part is painful to maintain. So the plan is, that each and every loader and plugin is going to depend on Webpack defaults. So we have this one dependency and we rely on it. So instead of having snowflakes, we have this one dependency and every loader and plugin points to one. And then we have similar setup on each project. We can still customize it, 
best of our practice, but it is a lot easier to maintain this way. Behind it is a, is a tool, MRM. It's like a migration tool for projects. So it can do, it can patch JSON and these configuration files. But yeah, you can, act, yeah, with the plugins. This is actually more complicated. Uh, it will take a long time to really dig into it. So I'll, I'll show a couple of basic examples. You get access to Webpack compiler and compilation. So compilation, it's going to contain only the dependency graph. And as you remember, the package itself, it's just like it's plugins, a lot of them. And behind this is package, Tapable. So if you want to understand that more, read Tapable and the API. Uh, because there's our, these plugins are, are really like related to Webpack, you have to develop the plugins against Webpack itself. Just a quick example. Here I capture options, and you have to implement apply method. And then you can do some, something with the options here. So that, this doesn't do much yet. But here we do actually something useful. So first we capture, and then we pick up the name. And then we set up, a, I mean, we listen to hook, emit hook, which is somewhere in late. And then we capture compilation, so we get the graph. <coughs> and now we write, so we get, get the name, so we get the file name, and we write a new file. That's, that's going to contain a single word. And we have to remember to call the callback in the end because without this, it will it will not work. So here we capture name and write it to a file. And in practice, you will have a lot a lot more code. But this uh, like just you see this structure a lot. So you have always like compiled plugins, this and that, and do something. So recap: start with loaders because they are so simple and nice to write. The event model is is what you see in the DOM. You can do sync, async processing, so just transformations. But plugins, they are like the key to Webpack. So if you want to achieve great things with the Webpack, you have to understand plugins. So questions? Have you changed something big between one and two with plugins? Or should they work? Yeah, I mean, I know there were some internal changes. Uh, and actually, this is a good time to like sorting. So we wrote migration guide. So if we have done like something right, this guide should describe what has changed. So it's actually quite quite a bit of changes, but they have been documented. But I know the API has lived a bit, so I will not expect each and every Webpack one plugin to work in Webpack two myself. So sometimes it might take some quick. Yep. Yeah, so is there any specific reason why plugins have, to, have been designed as classes? You can actually write them as functions. So this is actually what I mentioned earlier, because it's, it's, uh, you can have, as long as it has, has that apply, it's going to work. And Webpack doesn't care if it's a function or a class, because in, in the end, I mean, in, even in terms of functions or obje objects too. So it's going to work if you have function, and then you have function dot apply, and Blah blah blah, and uh, I mean, there's no. It's just convention. Yep. Can you add, uh, mix, like, and uh, yeah. So can, can yeah. So can you mix sync and async processing? So actually, it's possible to have both. So you can have async parts and sync parts, to my understanding. But I think, uh, like, I think you should just try to async. Yeah, and forget about sync because it's like hand, hand waving, but it's like same thing necessarily. So yeah, it's uh, it, it might it's most likely it's most likely the future way. So we have every, everything is just async. So we can actually ask like anything webpack right now because this is like the last slide. Yeah, so I guess the next step is to sell me sell my book to you. So the way it works is that you go to the site and you press buy. So you go it's really pop, you go Amazon, Kindle, or you can get like this really awesome signed edition. It costs only fifty dollars, so you can you can check it out. But yeah, the content is exactly freely available. So 
my hope is that if people like the content, they buy the book. Because it allows me to get to Vienna and play this soon. But yeah, it was made somewhere in North. And uh, thank you for attention. It was really great to be here today.